have quite a few panelists today, um, and they all present to an array of topics relevant to the work that they've been doing in the open government data space. Uh, my name is Keisha Taylor. I am the senior manager of global data services for TechSoup Global. Um, I work on the business uh, business planning and research for them, and one of the things that I'm specifically focused on now is the creation of a multi-stakeholder platform for those who are involved in philanthropy and social impact to try to connect communities offline, online, through also helping to, to them to actually be more educated about the use of data and own their data as well. So one of, uh, I'm just going to introduce the panelists. Um, this thought is Anne Gerald. Um, she's a professor at Queensland University of Technology, and um, she's been working on uh, yeah. intellectual yeah. property law, internet and e-commerce law, international trade law, yeah. and she's Boy, been really heavily involved in Creative Commons for Australia. Um, she's also uh, one of the organizers of the session. Um, next up is Shita Lakshmi, who is a program manager for the Southeast Asia Technology and Transparency Initiative. She's based at FIBOS, uh, their regional Southeast Asia office, and she's also the deputy chair of the multi stakeholder Internet, Indonesian Internet Governance Forum. Jeremy Mal Malcolm, he is senior policy officer for consumers in the digital age at Consumers International and he is coordinating their global programs on access to knowledge, broadband and consumer rights and representation in the information society from their Asia Pacific office. We also have Tomakai Watanabe, who is executive director for Common Sphere. Um, he's a he, he is a researcher specialized in ICT policies and information society issues, and he's been playing a leading role in Creative Commons Japan, and involved in the use of support and open licensing and use of licensed work. He's also an executive research fellow and associate professor at the Center for Global Communications at the International University of Japan. Um, we also have Walt Rodgitter, who is the research director of Knowledge Dialogues in Hong Kong, and Keith Booth, the program leader of the New Zealand Open Government Information and Data Program at Land Information New Zealand. Remotely, we have three panelists, Romain Nankum, who is head of innovation of the task force Italab, which leads open data policy under the French Prime Minister's authority. Sumanja, Chattapadri, researcher at Hasgi, and Priyanthi Daluate, who's an academic registrar at North, at North Shore College of Business and Technology. So, yes, you have a lot of panelists today. <laughs> so, first up is Anne, and she's going to present on um, the situation in Australia. Thanks very much, Keisha. Um, if anyone has any difficulty hearing this from down the back, please let us know. I realise it's quite a big audience today, so I'm not quite sure um, how well we're being heard. Um, before I start my presentation, I'd just like to say very briefly, um, some of you may not be aware that this is in fact a conversation that has continued through the last several IGFs. So various people in this group, myself, Keisha, and, and um, Waltrout, Keith the Booth, and others have actually participated either in person or remotely in uh, a session around open government data in IGF over the last several years. We're carrying on the traditional, although we're, we're, we seem to be kind of largely a female kind of group, which I think sort of says something, I'm not quite sure what, but we're actually carrying on, I guess really from a, a person who uh, got a lot of us involved and really paved the way in the very early days uh, in open government data in the UK, and that's Chris Corbett. And I hope that Chris is actually listening and remotely online. Uh, back home in Australia at QUT, my home institution, where we've done a lot of the work on open government data and Creative Commons Australia, introduced it through QUT. Um, my colleagues, uh, Neil Hooper, and my PhD research students are, are listening, and I hope they're taking good note. 
So we've all got a very short um, time allotted to us today. If you have more questions, hopefully we'll get a chance to discuss those when we have the discussion uh, sessions at the end of each four or five speakers. So basically what I'm going to do is throw in today, we're talking about internet governance and uh, shaping the governance framework for open government data. So if we want to achieve open access to reuse of government information data, we do in fact need an appropriate uh, governance framework, and this consists of various aspects, technical, policy, legal. We don't have any international treaty, we don't have any multilateral treaty on open government data. Um, and progress has actually occurred through disparate initiatives, uh, local, national, regional, plurilateral level. Uh, and in, in individual jurisdictions, initiatives have typically been bottom up. Uh, they're driven by individuals who see the importance of this, sections within um, government departments, uh, sometimes an entire department, uh, rather than being led by high-ranking strategists. That actually, in almost every jurisdiction that we can see, came much later where there has been that leadership. In many cases, it's still not there. So much of the effort also has come from very loosely structured network civil society groups which use the internet social media platforms to collaborate and who really cottoned on to the value of the digital environment, the value of data, the value of communicating quite early on. So what I've been involved with personally is both Creative Commons and have really helped shape Creative Commons thinking on how we actually uh, license data and also the Open Knowledge Foundation. Um, okay, so the institutional framework is still being formed uh, and it's only really quite recently that steps have been taken towards establishing an international institutional framework for open government data. So we've got things emerging such as the Open Government Partnership, Research Data Alliance. Um, it's important to actually remember that we've had cooperative institutional arrangements have long existed in specific areas. So we can see this in science data areas, organisations such as CoData. Um, in geodata, we've got the GEOS project. We've had a lot of international cooperation around polar information, Antarctic Treaty System, for example. We could continue on uh, in relation to various examples, statistical data, um, meteorological data, etc. But they seem to actually uh, relate to specific areas of, of data, often data, generally data that's actually produced um, and managed by governments. But what we've had since the mid 2000s, we've had numerous international organisations, internet, intergovernmental bodies, and governments have actually taken the step of issuing open data, open government data policies and statements of principles. They generally reiterate the value of open government data. They identify the key principles um, underpinning access yeah, to the use of data. Stuff. And they almost always seek to establish a default position that this open government data should be open access to the public under transparent conditions, non-discriminatory conditions, importantly, and conditions that are conducive to innovative reuse of the data. So this kind of key principle which you can see emerging is stated in open government data policies uh, is that legal rights in government information must be exercised in a manner that's consistent with and supports the open accessibility and reusability of the data. So it's not enough for it just to be made available um, so you can read it, but you should actually be able to use it and do something with it, reuse that data analyze it, create some new um, you know, um, uh, data sets from that. So, and particularly where public sector information is protected by copyright, so most countries in the world actually have copyright applying to what we would broadly call data or PSI, public sector information. Even stuff that actually consists of um, data in a, in a pure sense uh, can actually be protected by copyright. So what we've actually got is a statement coming through is that where PSI is protected by copyright, access should be provided under licensing terms which do not restrict its dissemination or reuse. I call this the open licensing principle. It's been recognised in many policy statements. The OECD statement, which really led the way back in this area in 2008, their recommendation on access to um, public sector information, the advance would be the default licence. So that's all been picked up and implemented, put into our guidance materials and so forth in Australia. And we actually have got them set out in a, a set of principles that's issued by our information commissioner. So principle one is the open openness uh, principle and principle six is the clear reuse rights principle, uh, which specifically mentions the CC by licence. 
Um, about a year ago, only a year after those principles had been issued, the Information Commissioner conducted a survey to see how departments right through the Australian federal public sector, how they understood those principles and how they were implementing them in practice. And what it actually found, so only one year after they, those principles were first issued, it found that already uh, almost 60% of agencies were already using the CC BY licence or another open content licence, but essentially got CC BY as the default or intended to do so within the, ne the next 12 months. 48% 40 of agencies had released almost or some of their PSI under open licensing. Uh, uh, so in fact, a quarter had already published all or most of their PSI under open licensing. And as I said, in Australia, when they say open, open licensing, it essentially does mean CC BY. So personally, I actually really think that we've got enough there now to actually look at how we can implement this principle, this open licensing principle, which relates to licensing of copyright or other similar rights. And I think we have an opportunity when we're actually going forward and negotiating bilateral and regional free trade agreements that have intellectual property chapters. We could have actually done this in retrospect when we negotiated the free trade agreement with the United States, which was concluded back in 2004. But the issues were really not so well understood or articulated back then. Uh, there was clearly a shift towards being able to liberate government information, make it available, not only for access, but for reuse, including commercial reuse. Um, but the differences in Australian legal and US legal cultures at the time really got, got us to the point where we really talked about the issue being should there be no copyright in government information as opposed to looking at how we could most effectively manage copyright without having to go through really quite a revolutionary process of removing copyright from all government information. Now the elements are much better understood and uh, at a minimum it's possible to state the elements of the principle as it applies to public sector information. So an important step in internet governance in relation to open government data would be to include the principle in international agreements such as bilateral, regional uh, FTAs that like IP chapters. Doing so would not contravene the, the provisions in TRIPS or the WIPO Copyright Treaty which um, limit the kinds of permissible limitations and exceptions uh, importantly, this is very much a pro-innovation approach and is consistent with good governance of the internet. So thank you. Uh, I've got a lot of reading material online if you want to have a look at it. So thank you very much. Hi. Next, we have Shita Lakshmi. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Because this, we have to, with a lot of panelists, we have to be very quick. I would like to highlight uh, before we go into the presentation first that this is um, the, the open data may not be that really famous yet in both countries, in the region of Philippines, but transparency is one of the most appropriate terms that we are using. The second is that uh, we are, um, I'm, I'm basing my experience uh, as a program manager in Southeast Asia, the Northern Transparency Initiative. Uh, for the last one year, so these are some examples that we have to see on the ground. Yes. So in brief, the general context, uh, Indonesia and the Philippines, we both are, those countries are the, the founders of open government partnerships. Uh, in Indonesia, we have the Freedom of Information Act, our law, that has been enacted in uh, uh, around 2010. Uh, in the Philippines, they have been on and off uh, on the Freedom of Information Act, so there is no Freedom of Information Act yet. Uh, so, uh, Indonesia is sharing the Open Government uh, Partnership uh, this year, uh, starting since uh, 1st of October 2013. Uh, and the civil society organizations, as well as some um, uh, international organizations, uh, and the private sectors are planning to make the open data hub in Indonesia to help really, especially the civil society organization, in providing the open data that is uh, basically related to their needs. Uh, in the Philippines, uh, they have a bottom-up budgeting that has been um, enacted by the president of Aquino, uh, and it's actually one of the issues of the transparency uh, issue. Uh, in November, uh, I have a friend back there named Al, uh, who can also perhaps explain further on the Philippines context, but in November there will be an open data hackathon also made by the government of the Philippines. So it's starting to go into the, 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 the scheme of the transparency. 
Um, I, I get it from the blog, written that it's open data to, for, in the perspective of, of Seattle, of the EVOS. We see that open data to be truly effective, there is a need to have the right information. Uh, it's also made available in a timely, reliable format that people want, and the rights of engagement and participation. It is really necessary to have the citizens also part of the of the whole process of open data and transparency and hopefully the, towards the accountability. We, what we found in the gap during our work in the last one year is that technology or open data is not directly in the business process in the related stakeholders, not in the government or, or the civil society or the citizen itself. We also need a reliable and interoperability data. So a lot of in Indonesia experience, there are a lot of uh, disconnection between one minister, one ministry to the other ministry uh, on the data. So it's not all interoperability. We also see that there is need to have a tailor-made provider to the data needs of the of the, the one that asking the citizens. Uh, there's also very low citizen engagement uh, in terms of the participations on the need of open data because what is the use in, in Indonesia, there are a lot of critics, what is the use to open your data if there is no one that uses that data. Uh, so that's, that's, the, that's the gaps that we found, that CRT have found for the last one year. Uh, so we, uh, these are two examples that we are doing in the Philippines and Indonesia. We have the Check My School or in translation Check Squad Group to improve school condition and governance through participatory monitoring of school performance. So these are uh, the, the open data of which is then um, being restored in the complaint handling mechanism in 50, in 50 schools throughout Indonesia. So uh, relay the, the data, uh, the transparency uh, in the, that field in school. We also uh, uh, support uh, Money Politics Online Question 2 in the Philippines. It's actually a citizen guide to election, public funds, and governance in the, in the Philippines. So uh, we are working with uh, PCID, Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. They have this uh, Money Politics Online Question 1 but it was not really engaging the citizens uh, and we were thinking how to make that data available online being used by the citizens uh, to be able uh, uh, to be part of the citizens in uh, doing the elections um, uh, and the governance in the Philippines. Yeah, thank you. I think what is needed for the internet governance, I agree with Anne, perhaps uh, some um, related to the um, among countries, uh, among among minister or among the uh, government to have sort of like a framework, a global framework on the interoperability of the data because that's really necessary. Okay. So I'm a representative of the civil society organization, OpenData.com, and I'm also um, honorary advisor to Petition 21, which is a Hong Kong government advisory body on these uh, future strategies. So I have uh, these two hats. And um, if we, I think um, Hong Kong, I mean, many of you may know, Hong Kong, everything that people ask is China, not quite. It is still uh, independent, uh, somewhat independent, special administrative regions, and the, the international uh, terms we talk about one country, two systems, and I think in open data terms, we can certainly talk about one country, two very different internet systems and policies. Okay, um, and Hong Kong is an interesting case, maybe for many other countries, uh, because. This navigating between being a very advanced knowledge economy, looking at the World uh, Knowledge Economy Index, uh, Hong Kong is uh, very high, um, and not being quite open. That means having lack of free information laws and having some other restrictions uh, that we often find in uh, 
in uh, non-democracies where certain information is simply not open because it's considered a confidential, commercial, or whatnot, although it is um, coming from a public finance organization. The Hong Kong government has just launched the 2014 strategy um, for uh, Digital 21. And um, this has a much broader scope for PSI. By the way, I also would like to mention, you can check what, how is your country actually thinking about open data by simply looking at what is it called. In some countries, they talk about open data policy. In other countries, they talk about public sector information. And there is actually a difference. So in Hong Kong and also in Singapore, they don't talk about open data. They talk about public sector information, uh, and also in, in Europe. So I think there is a slight uh, difference in meaning. And also, open data does not mean open government. That's also a very important uh, um, language, linguistic thing that we need to look at when we look at um, policies of different countries. Um, so in 2011, we had our first exper experiment, that took, uh, in which is like in every country, the government decides, OK, let's open up uh, some of our data sets in the portal and website, which is normally called data.gov.countrycode. In Hong Kong, it's called data.one.gov. Okay. And um, then they, the government puts out some data sets. Which one? I mean, it's kind of, is it random or not? I don't know. It's not really quite random, but it, it normally starts things like census, public facilities, uh, weather information, traffic information, uh, maps to a certain extent. So in a way, this kind of data that is already in the open open space or on the internet, but it's, it's now it is in open format. Um, and uh, so these data sets uh, increase, so the government opens more and more, then we have maybe food and hygiene departments, um, uh, environmental information, so I think if you look at different countries, what are they opening? Uh, we find a lot of similarities. I think it's always interesting to ask what is not open and uh, what is information that is still paid for. For instance, um, as you Hong Kong is a very important center for trade, but company registry information, for instance, although it's the public information, is not open, which is something that many journalists find disturbing because uh, there are so many shell companies in Hong Kong operating in China and other countries in Asia. So uh, it's actually quite, it would be quite important to have um, open access to these records. You can pay, you can, I mean, in principle, the data is open because you can actually pay a certain amount and then get the record. But it's not open in the sense that you uh, can do uh, uh, data analytics through the whole uh, database. So public sector, uh, and so this experiment uh, went quite well. And in uh, 2004, now for the 2014, they say the public sector information is now a default. That means all future uh, government information should be open uh, form of open access. Um, and through that policy, it is quite interesting to see that basically the government is looking for innovative apps and services. And I think that is also this kind of language is very typical for countries which are not really open. They want to focus, they want to benefit, they want to tap into the benefits of open data, creating digital communities, app developers, software people, software companies that use government information. But uh, um, they are not really encouraging the kind of research or uh, critical analytics about making data from, from finance, budgeting open parliament and so on. So they, they really try to focus on the um, on the easy, low-hanging fruit that they can uh, make interesting apps. And in fact, most of the apps that we have in Hong Kong right now are using real-time traffic information. So because it's very useful for many people to make real-time traffic information. But um, I think there are many other issues where we would like open data and it's uh, not, uh, not available. Um, yes, and, uh, now there's also a discussion of whether data that is owned by semi-government organizations like uh, utility companies, um, 
food companies that have energy background, which is very interesting for many environmental NGOs. Um, to open that, but that's very difficult because these companies are also considerably private data or commercial data, so it's a long step to, uh, to go there. And regarding copyright, um, uh, on the, it's a very complicated situation because on this data portal that the government put up, it says you can freely use all the data there, and it is free of copyright, free of licensing fees, and you can also you can use for commercial purposes and so on. But if, so if you find an environmental data set on that portal, you can use it and refer to your to this uh, website. But if you go to the website of the Department of Environment, you could not use that data because there are copyright data. So the government thinks that actually if the developers just use the data from the portal, the problem is gone. But I'm not sure. Maybe uh, Anne can comment on that uh, later. Okay, and another test case I think is if you look at your own country, do you have open parliament applications? I think that's also a really interesting application and we are just starting with it. Most governments uh, publish their minutes, the records of the meetings, and decision making, voting records and so on. But is this in open format? Can you use that data to manipulate and make different kind of analysis and so on? And that is something we are also just uh, starting um, in Hong Kong because, as you know, in 2017, Hong Kong might be the first uh, Chinese country which has a general election. And so I think our parliament is now um, getting ready to release more data and make it more. Okay, but um, just to summarize, I would like to mention that really um, I think um, uh, Hong Kong and Singapore and several other countries in Asia which are advanced internet economies are not necessarily that open when it comes to open data. And it's a very difficult balancing act. Thanks. Thank you, Roger. Um, now, Mr. Peter, please. New Zealand, Denmark and Finland have been ranked first equal in Transparency International Corruption Protections Index. In other words, we are seen as the least corrupt nations in the world. We're all the similar size, we're small. New Zealand is 4.4 million people. And government supports open government. Our uh, New Zealand government has approved three policy settings to establish foundations for good um, release of public information and data. That was under a, a activity called Support Open and Transparent Government. So we have a licensing framework, a set of principles, and a declaration to release high value public data. And that all must be released on our version of a portal data.gov.nz. So strong foundations. And also a strong mandate from government. So the policies were approved by our cabinet and we have a ministerial committee on government ICT. And then below that we have two committees of chief executives or what as many of you would say departmental heads. And they set the direction for ICT and for our information reviews. And they are all supported by the Secretariat where I am here. And that agency data champions are the key tool for us in terms of ensuring that this data supply is um, followed out and driven in the government part. So these data champions are at the second tier in all government departments. So a bit more about the policies. NZ Goal, our government open access and licensing framework, is like the Australian one. It gives advice 
on how to license copyright and non-copyright material from the legal reuse. Right? So we use the Creative Commons licenses. Again, the default is the CC um, 3.0 attribution by license. And departments can use the more restrictive licenses, but they have to have a strong case for doing so. And for non-copyright material, they must use a no-known rights statement. The principles essentially set the framework for managing all of our government held information. So that's public and personal information. So those principles, which I won't go through now in no time, essentially say manage your material well, have high quality. If it's, if it's restricted material, please protect it. Otherwise, make it open in reusable formats and where possible free because it's taxpayer funded already. Okay. And the declaration was a direct declaration to all government agencies to release public data. It's non-personal and unclassified data with high potential value for reuse. Now high potential value is a user then, the, the, the supply departments must work with users of their information to know what it is that they should be prioritizing. So they need to be working with civil society, with industry, with citizens, with all facets of government to understand what is high value. And there is our data.gov.nz. You'll see that we've got 2,500 data sets released. They um, are in open format and in most cases are licensed according to um, 55. And that 100 data request there is a key feature which we've been praised globally for. Users can go onto our site and request data that they would like released which hasn't yet been released. So, questions for other jurisdictions. Get government approval for your policy. Now, our government, when they approve those policies, they expect that those outcomes that we've already heard about, greater economic growth, better social outcomes, uh, greater knowledge creation, uh, greater efficiencies between departments and others sharing information, not duplicating it, and new knowledge, and of course, transparency and governance performance. So what we do in our secretariat, which we are, we're feeling pretty proud about, is that we meet twice a year with those senior officials, those tier two uh, champions. We release guidance for them, we offer training in goal, we've got a toolkit online, and most importantly, we work with them to find out how the information has been reused, what that impact is, and we publish case studies. And there's the link to them. They're at ict.gov.nz and we've got 14 case studies showing the impact of the reuse. And then we had our data directory, as I, I said. We work with our users and then all of that is reported in an annual report to Cabinet. So we go back to that governance structure that I illustrated before, working through those, reporting to Cabinet on whether the outcomes they expect have been, have been achieved. And we've developed a small version of a lead table where government departments can check their progress against other departments. So we're focused on the supply side, but it is all driven by user demand. Next, can talk to me about any other detail later? Thank you. Next, we're going to have Tomaki Watanabe, um, based on the situation in Japan. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, for the interest of time, uh, go to next, please. Uh, I'll keep this uh, uh, self introduction. I just said I've been able in Creative Commons Japan, as uh, one of the leaders of the Japan team, uh, and uh, I have recently co-founded Open Knowledge Foundation Japan, 
And then uh, as a, as a, my main job is an academic uh, uh, in the field of ICT policies and incubation society issues. I also sit on one of the government boards uh, implementing uh, open data in Japan. And then next week. Uh, this is the menu. Uh, my, my slide pack is uh, rather extensive, and I only touch on the, the, the uh, how do you say, uh, summary uh, part. So if you don't wanted to know more specific facts and uh, wanted to uh, uh, get links to other uh, resources in English, uh, please refer to the slide or just come to me and uh, we can talk. I'm more than happy to actually. And then next week, um, uh, an overview. Uh, so th uh, here's the Japan's uh, major developments. Um, uh, it, it happened in a relatively short frame of time. Uh, last summer, uh, June 2012, uh, we finally adapted the national strategy for open data. And then uh, that was followed by a, ja uh, a decent political support um, from the leadership, which is very important if, uh, according to what I found from uh, many uh, European uh, governments, uh, national and municipal together, um, as well as the U.S. Uh, that I know uh, comes comes with some political support in one form or another. And we had a change in the majority party, uh, but the new majority party leader, uh, the Prime Minister Abe, uh, was very quick to endorse open data. Uh, but he emphasized, uh, like some of you mentioned already, uh, economic benefits from it. He, he combined actually open data with big data and positioned those things as a source of economic benefits and strength. Uh, that may be a concern for some, for, uh, for some of us in the future. I'll, I'll touch on that later. And then uh, we got a decent institution for the execution of the policy. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so, previous, yeah. Uh, we got a decent institution for the execution. Uh, which includes a uh, newly created government CIO close to the matter. Uh, he knows what what means what it means to be uh, doing open data, and he has some more power to influence all the different government agencies. Without it, it's very difficult to press uh, all different government agencies to open up their data because so many of them are kind of afraid or apprehensive about opening up their data. And uh, we have pri uh, public private public-private joint conference. I think it's called something like Working Level Personnel Conference uh, for Open Data, uh, which I, I'm sitting on. Um, and, and this uh, is basically a joint uh, project between government and the private sector people to, to explore how best to implement the policy, which is very important because uh, Open Data when that done by government alone is not going to go well because it's very crucial to think of the user's perspective how best to release the data so that it could be used. And, and for that, uh, uh, the participation and involvement of users is very important. And then um, there is even a privately led but publicly supported, government supported forum uh, which does a lot of discussions and uh, occasional hosting of public events, including hackathons and symposiums. Uh, so those, those elements, I, I see that, it, again, it, it, uh, it happened within a very short frame of time, maybe within the uh, last two years, but it's very good. And then we got civic sector growing, which is, again, very important. Uh, I, I consider this as a part of recipe for success for any government or any society almost uh, in terms of open data because again without strong civic sector interested in use, making use of uh, open data uh, it's, it's, it's not very easy to expect any benefit coming out of uh, releasing data. So it's, it's very good that we have uh, technological as well as our social civic sector uh, having uh, interest in open data. And, and there are quite a few new organizations formed within the last uh, two years, uh, including uh, Open Knowledge Foundation Japan, but not, not limited to. 
and then uh, we are uh, very close to launching a national data portal. Um, this this would give uh, a significant push uh, impetus for the movement. Uh, but I have to say, uh, even at this point, before the launch of any national uh, comprehensive national data portal, uh, we we are already having hackathons and uh, talk events and get together. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some. Uh, organizations formed to to work on open data related issues. So um, civic sector is almost going ahead of the, the national movement. And there are also some uh, municipal governments. They are, you know, there are so many of the municipal governments and some of those uh, have invariably in many countries uh, uh, strong leaders who are interested in making innovative uh, policy decisions like uh, open data. So there are already some municipal governments in Japan already doing open data practicing, and there are some many uh, there are uh, many pioneering pioneer, pioneering projects uh, by uh, ministries and other gov national government agencies as well as municipalities. I I have some details in my slide pack, but I don't uh, discuss that much. But I, I have to say there are two ministries very uh, active. Uh, one is Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication. Uh, uh, it used to be a post and telecom ministry and, and uh, 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 Ministry of uh, Municipality Issues. Uh, they are combined to form this uh, uh, ministry. So that's one. And another one is Ministry of Economic, uh, Economy, Trade, and uh, um, uh, uh, Industry. Uh, uh, those two ministries uh, are the pioneers. And then uh, we are discussing how to evaluate the policy performance as well as the data standards among other things. Uh, would you look at that? And, um, okay, there are, there are some early trials by these uh, major ministry, government uh, uh, agencies, the top two being the, the innovators, major players, others are doing something at least. And then next, please. Uh, these are the challenges that I expect. Uh, uh, sh short term, we have to revisit probably the licensing and other conditions of the reuse, uh, partly because uh, only after seriously trying to do the open data, uh, some government agencies realize they really do not, uh, they are not really ready to do this. And they have to come up with uh, some um, understand, uh, some reasons why they don't want to do it and then we will discuss the licensing issues and other conditions. We also have to communicate any copyright or non-copyright, any legal restrictions that exist regarding the use of the data and we are trying to have some marking system uh, uh, inclusive of copyright but not limited to. And then in the short term we have to think of policy evaluation or how to measure the impact, especially I, I personally think um, uh, B2B usage is a key, and then uh, because it's uh, difficult to capture that kind of usage. And then in the long term, uh, we have to think of government operation, how to how best to operate the government so that it's easy to make use of the data for internal decisions as well as release the data to the public. And then uh, it, we are yet to uh, touch on the issue of cataloging of all the data that government has. That, that's going to be a down slide. Next, please. So um, here is a more of a big, big picture issue that I, I um, have these days in mind. Uh, Japan is getting close to this kind of first runner or front runner uh, status by having strong support from the political leadership. And some public officials who get the, get the idea of openness. Uh, Japan is still a little weaker than some other governments, but uh, we are getting close. And then there's a good arrangement for the execution, and then the public uh, participation from the civic society is good. Uh, and then uh, there is some uh, uh, collaboration that, that we can expect uh, a reasonable amount of collaboration so that data is released so that the, the user can uh, find and use 
Um, and th those are the kind of first mover strategies, as I think. And by doing this, they can uh, create big splash, releasing huge amounts of data, and attracting a wider part of the society, which in turn leads to a great amount of use and extensive network among the related parties and that could result in some unexpected success. We all know that data could have an unintended usage that, that you know uh, that goes beyond the imagination of the original data holder. That's why it's important partly to publish the data. Uh, and then the last slide is the next one. Whereas uh, the the there is the other way, which um, I thought at one point Japan might take this route, but it seems like Japan is going away and going to the front runner model. But you know, there is a second mover kind of advantage too, uh, doing really uh, doing the open data really efficient by identifying where what what are the data that's uh, high in the return on investment, and then doing careful cost-benefit analysis from other government's uh, practice and then uh, try to focus on uh, only the, the kind of data that, that's going to produce great amount, a great amount of benefits. Uh, that's less, less, less risk-taking, that means less of unexpected benefits as well, so I wouldn't call this that innovative, but it might turn out to be rather efficient in a sense. That's, that's, uh, I, I see that Japan is moving away and going to more of innovation frontier. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. So, we heard quite a few panelists now, so I think it's it, will be, it will be great to uh, open for some questions. Um, Oh, I know, but we have. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. Go ahead, Rami. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I'd love to take a different um, perspective on open data, which is um, uh, more about how can the internet governance regime do more to support open data initiatives. And um, I've identified that there's three areas related to internet governance that could. Um, support open data, um, and those are standards, intellectual property, and soft or hardball mandates to release open data. So I'm going to go through each of those in turn, and I apologize that I don't have any slides, um, but I do have a couple of papers uh, which I'm partly drawing on, and if you'd like a copy of those, you can see me later and I'll give you my card. Um, so on standards, it's very important, of course, for um, supporting open data that there are open standards in which the data can be published and accessed conveniently. And so the risk is that um, uh, the standards that are being developed um, are becoming less open and interoperable. We have um, a current example of the W3C's proposal for encrypted media extensions, which is essentially DRM on the web, um, which could lock up a lot of online video. And um, this has been supported by lobbyists from content industries and uh, intermediaries, including Microsoft, Netflix, and surprisingly, perhaps also the BBC and Google. Um, but the, w, the broader W3C community has been uh, predominantly against um, the addition of DRM to the web standards. Um, but regardless of that, the director, um, Tim Berners-Lee, has decided, has determined that the W3 is going to proceed with the development of a specification. Um, one of the uh, arguments that's often used in favour of this is that, well, we're just developing a standard, we're not mandating that you actually use the standard, we're just making it available for those who want it. But this concept doesn't really work, because in practice we've found that, um, you know, if you build it, they will come. Um, an example of this is the broadcast flag specification that um, was developed for um, TV transmissions to protect content from being recorded. Um, although this is just a standard, and they said, oh, there's no mandate for this, it's just, we're just developing a standard, so don't worry. Um, soon enough, it led into a mandate from the FCC in the United States, 
Um, admittedly, that has since been officially eliminated, mainly for constitutional reasons, but it's become a de facto standard anyway, and it's, it's been incorporated essentially into the new um, digital TV specifications. And even more tellingly, Microsoft incorporated it into Windows Media Center software, despite the fact there was no mandate at all from the FCC that applied to Microsoft. So, and then, meanwhile, EU lobbyists are trying to insert something similar into the new EU copyright directive. So, a standards body just saying, oh, well, we're not taking a policy position on this, we're just developing a standard just on the off chance that someone wants to use it, actually it does have an effect on policy debates. The availability, of, you know, the effort of going to develop this standard actually leads into um, the expectation that it will be used by policymakers, mandated by policymakers. So that's dangerous. And the standards bodies need to be alert to this. They need to be proactive in seeking stakeholder input beyond the engineering community. They need to realise that lobbyists are going to be um, at their door uh, trying to push these standards through. And that public in broader public interests are maybe not being represented. So A, they need to be proactive in seeking broader input. And B, they need to allow bodies that are more specialised in public policy development to drive their standard development agendas. So that includes governments, but it also includes um, bodies like the IGF. We should have more influence in what, say, W3C is doing, what standards it's developing, which standards it's refraining from developing. Okay, so that's number one, standards. Number two, intellectual property. Um, there are, uh, intellectual property, uh, is of course a, a grab bag of various different legal regimes which include copyright, patents, and um, sui generis database rights. And all three of those require certain flexibilities to allow, um, to support open data. So for copyright, for example, it's important to have the ability to dedicate material to the public domain. I mean, licensing is a hack around copyright limitations in, in a sense. But if you just don't want to have any copyright protection at all, then you should be able to dedicate data to the public domain. And not every legal regime allows this. In some legal regimes, it's impossible to get stuff into the public domain without waiting for 50 or 70 or 120 or whatever it is years. Um, so that's important. It's important not to have database rights, uh, which Europe has, uh, America doesn't. Um, so they are not, a, they, they generally are a, a stumbling block to. Um, open data. Um, and in terms of patents, it's important not to extend patent rights to um, things that we want to access in, in uh, open data sets, such as a product of nature like DNA. So um, how can we make sure that these needed flexibilities are in intellectual property rules that are being established at the transnational level? Um, well, uh, certainly processes that have been used um, to set new IP rules, such as ACTA and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, are not an acceptable model. And uh, while I've been sitting here uh, on this panel, I've been following the tweets from another panel, which I was also interested in, trying to follow both at once, um, and, and they were saying exactly the same thing, um, that uh, we need to have more of a multi-stakeholder model in, in global IP policy development. We have that in internet world. It's a work in progress for internet governance, but, but that's certainly our aim, to be multi-stakeholder. And we've been trying that in documents like the Tuners Agenda, um, which have set out some basic standards for multi-stakeholderism in internet governance. But what about in IP policy development? Um, we need to make sure that it extends there, um, so that these needed flexibilities are, are not just ignored um, when these new instruments like ACTA and the TPP are being pushed through. Um, it's... Uh, uh, so. Due to shortness of time, I'm going to skip a few points. Um, and then thirdly, the soft or hard law mandates. Um, so, uh, the earliest of these that I'm aware of um, is when the OECD issued its principles and guidelines for access to research data from public funding in 2007. And, um, and that's, that was certainly a, a good step. The OECD, though, is, of course, a relatively limited um, organisation geographically, and so it's, um, uh, uh, and at the time also, the, uh, this was in 2007, so it was just prior to the expansion of the OECD's advisory committees to include an advisory committee for civil society, which exists now. So 
Uh, although that was a very good start, I think um, a better example that followed is the Open Government Partnership, um, which had a more multi-stakeholder um, process. And one of the principles of the Open Government Partnership was um, as follows. It says, we commit to proactively provide high value information, including raw data, in a timely manner, in formats that the public can easily locate, understand and use, and in formats that facilitate the use. Um, now, these are both soft law instruments, uh, and Anne made reference to the fact that there is no treaty. Um, so, should we work towards a treaty? Um, that's a very good question. Um, the, uh, if we do, then we should certainly try and strive towards a multi-stakeholder process that is fully inclusive of civil society. And it is possible to do this. Um, this year, of course, um, WIPO uh, ended up agreeing on the Marrakesh Treaty for the Blind. Um, and that was a relatively inclusive process. So if we can work towards, in the longer term, the development of a treaty on open data, um, that would be beneficial, provided that we're able to support that with a really inclusive multi-stakeholder process. Um, so I do have some other points, but uh, since we're running over, I'll, I'll leave it there. And uh, if you want some more information, you can catch up with me later. Thank you. Now I will open up the floor uh, for questions, um, and after that, that will be for about 10 minutes, and after that we'll be taking a more time with it. Yes, there's the CRM concern. Uh, yes, uh, the, the W3C has, has decided to, that, that is within the charge of work on that stuff. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly with your multi stakeholder comments, right? It needs to be multi stakeholder. The problem is that W3C is already multi stakeholder. Right? So when we put out the call to get comments from the public, from government on digital rights management and HTML, very few people came forward and made any comments, and it doesn't. It's, it's completely open to the public. People can people can do it. It's just nobody did it. And so what that what that um, does is it makes it seem as if civil society and the public don't really care all that much about the RM, right? Because if they did, they would have had somebody from government come in and say something about it. So what ends up happening is the engineers end up fighting against it, and then Netflix and Microsoft and Google come in and flatten the engineers because they say we are a large organization, we have business needs that are not being met, and civil society hasn't stepped in to say that this is, this is problematic for them. So I guess, I guess my question is, what can we do to remedy that? Because it's already set up in the, in the way that you say it should be set up, but it's not working, right? So, so how, do we, how do we address that? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I mean, there were some groups that did um, weigh in on this, the Free Software Foundation, Electronic Frontiers Foundation. Um, EFF joined as a W3C member at a cost of several thousand dollars per year. The W3C has got quite high annual membership fees, um, which is an impediment to civil society participation. Um, but I think uh, one of the problems is that the W3C is seen as just, well, I don't mean this in a negative way at all, um, is seen as a technical standards body rather than a body that deals with larger public policy issues. And um, this runs it into problems, not just in this case, but there are other examples as well, such as the Do Not Track standard, which ran into similar problems uh, where lobbyists sort of descended on the group um, and it was trying to decide the, the broader public policy dimensions of this issue rather than just dealing with the technical issues, which it, uh, it's much better suited to. And um, in some ways, and I said this in a previous uh, panel, I don't blame the W3C so much for that. I blame the European Commission and the Federal Trade Commission for, for, for going to the W3C and, and letting them sort out this policy issue rather than providing proper guidance to say this is exactly what should be done at, at a policy level. You sort out the nuts and bolts. So I think the W3C is in a difficult position, but 
the best that it can do is to, as I tried to say, be more proactive in actually, rather than just having an open door and saying, hey, you come to us, rather it needs to go out to the community and, and pull people in and say, uh, we need you. And, and even to support them in some way with finance, the travel to meetings, things like that. I mean, this is difficult. Um, other bodies have the same problem. The OECD has the same problem. They have an open door, um, but physical travel to meetings is a barrier. Um, time. Um, I work for the global consumer movement. We have 240 members in 120 countries, uh, member organisations in 120 countries. The number of issues that I'm required to deal with um, are staggering. There's one full-time person in my organisation dealing with all technology issues, and it's me. So there are big capacity deficits there, and there needs to be some work done by the standards organisations, by the intergovernmental organisations, to help redress those capacity deficiencies. So, anyone else on the panel wants to offer anything? Okay, thanks for the question. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bai Gong from Thailand. Uh, I'm working for a civil society group to try to initiate the open data in Thailand. So, I would like to thank you all the panelists, uh, especially Mr. Watanabe, that uh, I also have questions that uh, you said you had a short time, like two years for working on the open data in Japan. And I would like to know is, uh, what is the success factor for making success? And also, maybe the quick, this question is for our panelists is about how you measurement about the uh, beneficiary of the citizens from the open government data, how to measure. Yeah, which way to measure that. Thank you. So, uh, well, thank you for the question. Um, the key success factor, uh, why Japan could make so much progress within a short time of, uh, short, short amount of time? Uh, that's a good question, but I think it helps that the US was making a big splash and the EU was making a major revision of the, the PSI directive. That meant uh, in a Japanese, typical Japanese policy circle, that means, oh, we have to do something to catch up. You know, that's a very similar uh, familiar story for us. So, so we did some international research and key ministries and uh, uh, research, uh, uh, research institutions as well as think tanks uh, bought that idea, partly because of the widespread use of the, the cell, uh, mobile phones, smartphones, uh, that could be used as a platform for apps, and also the, the buzz ex that existed already regarding the data, which is big data. Uh, so it kind of made an immediate click, and it was easy for many people in the in the industry, the government, and the private sector, that uh, uh, the civic sector that uh, this is going to happen. This is going to be interesting. This is going to benefit the society. Uh, so that's why maybe people jumped onto the bandwagon very quickly. And the other thing that's uh, rather domestic, but not necessarily limited to. Japan. I, I remember talking with Kita uh, 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 about uh, two years ago, uh, one and a half years ago, maybe, uh, uh, at APR IGF, uh, the Pacific Regional IBF in Tokyo, uh, that uh, in New Zealand and maybe even in Thailand and in Japan, disaster uh, prompted the government to look into the data communication, even within the government agencies, as well as partnering with uh, other relief organizations and civic sector or private sector. Because if you have an earthquake of that magnitude, everyone, has, everyone who can help has to do some help. But coordination is such a crucial part of effectiveness of the relief uh, effort or uh, immediate disaster response effort. So uh, Japan, actually turned its open government policy directions to focus more on open data, some people say, after that uh, major earthquake. Uh, that's another um, unfortunate success factor that has affected Japan. Yeah, I'm also like to add uh, 
something here. I think uh, don't, disaster is very helpful in bringing together different stakeholders, but it could also be any other um, issue in the, in the uh, national or city level that is of concern to many people. And in many cities, this could be environmental issues, climate change adaptation issues. Everything where you can see that um, putting different stakeholders together and creating a good solution together makes sense. And uh, in Hong Kong, we have a big discussion now on inequality, you know, having uh, really poor people in a very rich city. So how can we how can we have new ideas for dealing with uh, poverty uh, or have a new understanding of poverty? That's one issue. And another thing that I find more and more important is to have a really good university courses on data journalism or data science. <coughs> And in many countries, you don't have that. That means also have the people who really have skills to use this data. And in Hong Kong, we have two schools which are really good. We um, uh, uh, have open, open John, open data journalism courses and research centers. That, that I think is really critical because they are the experts who can also bridge between civil society, business, and government because they develop the, the stories that are interesting for for a city or a nation. <coughs> I'll just pick up on the data journalism and the earthquake crisis. We've been able to persuade our journalism trainers to introduce courses that are part of the of the university structure. And so, um, in in the near future, journalists going to, through their normal courses will also learn about how to how to um, investigate and use data. That's a big step. In terms of our earthquake, yes, there was a, a great movement by open data people to help get important information out to people about what, where they could buy petrol, where they could get prescriptions, how they could get from A to B. And we're now picking up on that and making sure that the, the infrastructure will continue after the crisis to prevent that the reliance on data that it wasn't authoritative and stored by the local authority now becoming something that they do. And just one final thing for us is, um, and everyone will have this, every government has its priorities. Make sure that you're working on the data that is going to be helping deliver on government's priorities. And that is of great importance to, the, to your political master. Uh, I would have to answer on how to measure. Uh, in Indonesia, where uh, uh, on the base of Indonesia, where it can be open data or data is not uh, by culture, not as part of the decision making process. I think what how to measure the open data is part. Open data is part of the open government. Open data is part of transparency. And I think how to engage with the citizens, have a quality. A dialogue between the citizens and the public holders uh, uh, with the public institutions and I think also uh, how the demand uh, from the citizens also being close. I think that's really important for for, for the uh, open access. Uh, Hello, uh, my name is Mark I am the Open Data Consortium in Indonesia. My concern is on the demand side of open data. Uh, as we, as many countries have successfully effort making data open to public, my question is uh, how to make people, citizens, also industry, use the data? Uh, because in Indonesia, uh, Indonesian civil society has great experience in passing uh, freedom of information law. And it's a great law, but after the law is passed, enacted, and the problem is the demand of the public information is very slow, very small rate of demand, while the instant investment building the infrastructure system, the commission, etc. So my question is, uh, do you have experience how to promote people using the open data, uh, how to increase the demand of open data. Uh, 
Thank you. Yes, that's the most important question and the hardest one to answer. Because in the past, um, all, all countries are required under their Official Information Act or their Freedom of Information Act to respond to requests for information. Whereas this is turning the, the whole um, issue around and making information available ahead of those requests. But then you, may, you don't know what to make available if you haven't had the request. So we are um, working with our government departments to encourage them to work with their users to have a better understanding of what, how their data is used themselves. And that takes time, but we've, we've seen some really, really good examples, even with our statistical department, where you would think they would know how official statistics are used. They have, are now working much more closely with their core stakeholders and to broaden the, the range of those stakeholders to go beyond government, which has been the traditional, the traditional um, audience for, um, for official statistics. So if you, if you want to come and talk to me later, I've got some other examples. I have a comment from a remote participant, from the remote hub at QUT, about the disasters. Natural disasters also played a role in the Australian story towards adopting CC licensing. These were bushfires rather than earthquakes, however. We're going to take one more question and then we're going to go to the remote panelists. Thank you. Artyom I'm from Kyrgyzstan. Uh, public foundation civil initiative on internet policy. So my question may be it's opposite to the previous. Uh, so do you see any ways uh, how to encourage governments of uh, to create for near aggressive countries, not transparent and uh, corrupted, uh, how to encourage them to publish that, how to encourage them to support open state initiatives? Thank you. May I try? Uh, so, yeah, I'll, I'll be short because I'm, I'm not from an oppressive country, but um, in, in general, I think it, it helps to first uh, to show the international rankings, uh, perceived transparency index, or uh, there are some other open data related specific uh, international rankings and metrics comparing different countries, and then uh, there are some specifications, what to do, how to do of open data. So that's one. Another is, uh, like Kita mentioned, some examples. Uh, how successful open data could be, how beneficial it could be to the citizens, to the economy, and uh, telling politicians what we are missing out by not doing open data. That, that would be my strategy. But I, I would just add that I think it's really important to couch this not just in terms of transparency, uh, human rights, etc. I think in many countries it's very much a challenge, but you still really want to get in the skills and the understanding of why this is important. And that's why I really tend to take it more from the innovation point of view. There are many areas where it's not politically sensitive at all, and you can really very readily make the case. In fact, uh, essentially in the major literature review that I did, so if we go up to where this really took off, so before 2008, 2009, what you'll find is you can go back 50 years or more, and we've got all these great uh, science collaborations, and really you've got the, the genesis of an organisation that's still quite vibrant and involves cooperation of scientists from all around the world, CoData, which is all really based around you know science data, and, and in fact some of the most inspiring presentations that I've actually seen, some of the best collaborations that I've seen are actually in that science community. So the skills, the, the concepts, the ideas are really actually pretty much similar. Uh, and there are already governments or government funded organisations in, in the research space which actually do collaborate very effectively um, and open up data in various ways. But it tends to actually be within, within a specifically defined community under their own rules. Uh, they may actually have rules of international cooperation for how science operates in this area, 
in some cases, such as the Antarctic, we've got an actual free system where it actually says open data is actually required for scientific researchers under the treaty. So perhaps coming at it from a different angle, we can see the benefit. Um, but, you know, and essentially, I guess it's really establishing a practice of mindset so that ultimately when, you know, socially, politically, um, countries are able to make steps more towards openness and transparency, it could be extended, you know, to other areas. That's probably the approach that I have. And just one final point. Um, the Open Government Partnership, I think there's about 50 countries who join now. And yeah, maybe um, those, some of those countries are with the other countries to encourage their people. Ever, ever, very highly. But it is different. Just one more quick thing. Um, uh, in many countries, I don't know about you yet so much, but in many countries, uh, the people who can support open data come from Wikimedia community, open source uh, developers, and Creative Commons team. Uh, all those people who are in the openness movement at large. They are very quick to organize and support the initiative. So if your your country hosts some of those, that's maybe one of the first things to try. Okay, thank you. So we're gonna move to the remote panelists now. Um, first up will be Wumin Lankom, who is leading the open government data policy under the French Prime Minister. Agency or department, 
um, and uh, really working with um, a sort of uh, a, a like network of In this case, yes, yeah, um, I'm going to do a brief uh, presentation from Jen Reeson at the National Archives in the UK. Yes. Yeah. So um, while audio, we are, we are having audio issues, we'll go to that um, and come back to it later. Okay, he's back now. <laughs> Can you put the volume up? If you can't hear, um, uh, we can't hear. <laughs> so we'll go on as we, we plan. Um, can you come back down and uh, we're going to have Anne to thank on this. Sorry, we've just got a very short set of slides from, that were sent through from Jim Redham from the UK National Archives. And I'm just going to briefly run through these. We'll make these available online. I've got 30 copies, people actually want copies as well. So just running very briefly through the um, National Archives um, perspective on development in the United um, so what we're what they're looking at is um, they're working on open data strategies, um, review of public information uh, carried out by Stephen Shakespeare. Uh, they've established data of scale UK and there's work going on with their transparency board and panels as well. Uh, the next slide uh, looking at global development from the UK perspective. Um, they're actually the current chair of the um, um, GA and. Um, as, um, as president and um, uh, lead co-chair of the International Open Government Partnership, they're promoting transparency and open data on the global stage. The Open Government Partnership Summit is being held in London uh, very shortly. 
and uh, open data is a very significant uh, element of the work of the Open Government Partnership. Um, in 2013, the UK is also president of GA, uh, met early this year, and as we saw in my presentation, she the Open Data Charter. Okay, so um, Open Data Charter and the PSI Directive, um, important um, statements of principle in this area. Open Data Charter sets up five strategic principles. Uh, these include the expectation that all government data will be published um, openly by default, uh, with principles also to increase the quality, reuse, um, and quantity of data made available. And the, there is, in fact, a U, U, EU directive uh, of 2013 that amends the directive of 2003 on the reuse of public sector information. This was recently adopted in June this year after a year and a half of negotiations to achieve a workable solution and member states have got to implement national legislation by July 2015. Um, uh, issues in the PSI Directive, these are the main features, I'm not going to run through these several slides. Um, the PSI Directive has specific uh, implications for um, museums, libraries um, and archives uh, in the public sector which are within scope. There are some special rules that are going to apply in this area. Again, that, that information is on the slide if you need to read that in more detail. Um, also, there's some interesting initiatives going on in the UK National Archives. Um, they have an online catalogue um, discovery with an API which provides a vast resource for developers, academics and students to reuse their data. So going to that question of, you know, how can we actually enable our users to really use the data? Uh, here we've got in the UK an example of the National Archives, which is really like a vast store of um, data actually making it possible for its um, customers out there, not only in the UK but worldwide, to in fact use that. So they've got an example here of uh, just the visualisation in the centre of the slide, which shows the volumes of naturalisation into Great Britain from each country by year. And they've got a slide which is shown in red on the graph, which shows the impact uh, of an event like the Chinese Cultural Revolution had on the increase in Chinese naturalisation. So, for example, that data comes from their home office records, from certificates of nationalisation, declarations of British nationality and declarations of allegiance. So, that's an example to, you know, how you can actually use what we talked about before in the earlier session of the administrative records and you can actually find ways of getting the data out and, and make it uh, tell the story. So that's from Jim Resum at the uh, National Archives. If you want further information, contact Jim. They couldn't participate uh, remotely today just because of the time difference, but um, Jim's been very active, uh, actively involved in this area of opening up the data many years. Okay. So, being mindful of the time, we have about 10 minutes. Um, I think it'll open up to questions. If someone has a question. Just one question and final remarks from the panel. Be brief. <coughs> um, <coughs> working from uh, Jeremy's open uh, standards sort of way. I'd like to ask the panelists if their countries have a specific open standards policy. And uh, it seems important that for open data, open standards are either mandated, and please tell if it's a mandate or if it's an option. Uh, and how do you come to that position, whatever it is? Thanks. That in, in New Zealand, we have guidelines on open, using open source. We don't have an open standards policy um, that's been approved. We do, in our into goal principles, recommend no use of DRE. In Japan, I think I have heard some open data related people suggesting that maybe we should. Uh, uh, try to abide by the open standard as well as using open source software, but I don't think it's practice. There's no official decision there. 
This whole area of um, open standards and government is something that really has not received a great uh, amount of attention. Standards generally are not something that people tend to uh, research unless they're out, outside of the um, communities that, that develop standards. I actually did a paper, I did some research on this um, a few years back and there was a paper of mine online which is open standards and, and government moving, I think it's actually called moving towards open standards. I think that there, uh, what you'll find in many countries um, in standards framework is that there, there is discussion of the importance of governments using open standards where they possibly can. Um, the other side of the coin is that it shouldn't be the case that governments require um, the general community, because of the regulatory effect of doing so, of using proprietary standards or, or adopting standards which require the use of proprietary technology because that would be able to actually made an impact on, on the community. So essentially standards when used or incorporated by governments into um, legal or legislative or administrative frameworks can in fact have a regulatory effect. The government needs to be cautious about requiring the use of standards which are which would require additional expenditure on use of proprietary technology. I think that we generally a movement towards open geospatial standards, which is a big area of the open data. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's two minutes left. So my last question. Um, so if there's any, like last minute remarks from any of the panelists, just one. <laughs> Let me know as you're going to wrap up. Can you guys just go and have some lunch? Look, a lot has already been achieved and a lot, there's been a lot of development in the last few years. I think we're actually seeing a lot of international agreements and cohesiveness developing around with some of the aspects of where we need to go. Uh, and I think that there are ways that we can start really consolidating that. I uh, took very really often in the past few years. I mean, as you know, events like the Open Knowledge Conference and Open Data Institute, so I think internationally there are a lot more attention to um, open data these days. Uh, so maybe formally it started in 2008 with the OECD uh, principles, but I think only in the past uh, one or two years we can really see that, uh, see developments in the most surprising countries, and that's really interesting to, to watch. Uh, so as an academic, I attend many conferences where in a, invariably I find that the most interesting discussions happen actually between the sessions. So please do not hesitate to come to us and further discuss this because there's so much, so much more. So I'm not going to keep you from your lunch, please. Yeah. Enjoy. Yes, yeah, so we, the all of the slides will be made available online. And there's also a workshop evaluation that's been made available by the IGS. So we appreciate you filling that out. Um, and uh, oh, the UK slides are also there um, from the uh, UK National Archive. And we would definitely like to thank the remote participants. We're really sorry that we couldn't have the remote panelists, um, all of them, um, be speak today. Thank you guys for coming, given that it's a packed room, actually, it seems like this is a really relevant topic for the Internet Governance Forum. Thank you.